Relisha Rudd, born on the 29th of November 2005, was just eight years old when she went missing from the homeless shop where she lived with her mother, stepdad, and her three brothers in Washington, D.C., USA. In 2014, Alicia resided in the former D.C. General Hospital turned homeless shelter and had been living there since 2012. A far cry from a real home, the shelter was prone to heating outages, mice infestations, and bed bugs, causing Relisha so much misery that she'd often fake being ill while staying with relatives so that she wouldn't have to return home. Relisha's mother was barely an adult herself when she had her little girl, being 27 years old when her daughter went missing. Shamika Young had grown up in the foster care system and homeless shelters, despite having an extended family that passed her daughter from one to another when she was born. This only added to Alicia's turbulent childhood, where at least three separate complaints were brought to child services about abuse and neglect involving Relisha and her siblings. However, no charges were ever brought against Shamika Young or any other family members. Teachers at Relisha's school, Payne Elementary, claimed Relisha often turned up with filthy hair, dirty clothes, and an empty stomach. They kept spare clothes aside for her, with cheerleading coach Shannon Smith helping the little girl wash before class. In 2014, Alicia's life took a sinister turn. Her mother became friendly with 51-year-old Khalil Tatum, a janitor at the shelter who had spent a total of 17 years in prison for various crimes, including burglary, larceny, and breaking and entering. Despite Tatum being known for mixing with the residents and paying particular attention to young girls, but never boys, he'd never been disciplined for his unsavory actions. Tatum soon became known as Relish's godfather, and it wasn't long before Shamika allowed her daughter to go on trips and stay with Tatum. He indulged Relisha with gifts such as tablet PCs and trips to see Disney on ice, and she often returned from their outings with new clothes or a manicure. Then, around February 26th, Alicia stopped showing up at school, but she was not reported missing. Family members gave varying reasons as to why they never reported her as such, with Shamika's justifications being particularly odd. At one point, she claimed she knew her daughter was safe with Tatum, while at another, she claimed Relisha was with her sister and that she didn't know otherwise. To account for her missing child, Shamika told Payne Elementary that Relisha had health problems and was in the care of Dr. Tatum. To make things all the more concerning, she later claimed that Melissa, Shamika's mother, and Alicia's grandmother, was the one who forged the doctor's notes. A social worker for the school arranged a meeting with Dr. Tatum, but upon arriving at the shelter, was surprised to find that no such person existed, and that Tatum was simply a janitor who had left his shift early that day. The social worker immediately contacted authorities, and by the time a search for Alicia was conducted, she'd missed a month of school. Although a huge search was launched to look for the missing eight-year-old, the efforts of all involved were fruitless. Soon, authorities found unsettling CCTV footage of Tatum and Relisha. The first saw the pair walking down the hallway of a Holiday Inn Express in Northeast Washington on February 26, 2014, while the second saw them walking into a room in the Days Inn on New York Avenue. This was dated March 1, 2014 and is the last known proof that Relisha was still alive. On March 20th, Tatum's wife, 24-year-old Andrea, whom he was legally separated from since February 2014, was found dead in a room at Red Roof Inn in Oxon Hill. It was theorized that Tatum murdered her, perhaps for knowing too much about Relisha or for finding out about her fate. A friend of Tatum's confessed to authorities that he'd looked up information on and downloaded images of a handgun, and put them onto an iPad after Tatum had asked him to do so. On March 31st, while police searched for the missing eight-year-old in Kennelwith Park, they stumbled across the body of Tatum in a shed. He was dead from an apparent suicide and left no information regarding the fate of Relisha. Despite the fact that Relisha hasn't been found, many still hope for her return. Since her initial disappearance, authorities have searched along the Anacostia River in January 2018 and in underground tunnels in January 2019, both located near the shelter, but to no avail. Relisha's three brothers have since been put into foster care, and Shim Kiang, her mother Melissa, and Relisha's stepdad, Antonia Wheeler, all appeared on an episode of The Steve Wilco Show. The homeless shelter has also been shut down. Many theories surround Alicia's disappearance. 
While authorities believe she was either murdered by Tatum or sold into trafficking, many online sleuths speculate Shamika sold her daughter to Tatum for money or perhaps to cover some sort of drug debt. This is partly reinforced by photos on social media that showed Antonio Wheeler with wads of cash in his mouth and showing off new trainers and a new mobile phone. Many users compare the disappearance of Alicia Rudd to the murder of Shania Davis, a five-year-old killed in 2009 by Mario McNeil. The pair were also seen together on CCTV, and police believe Shania was sold to Mario as a way of repaying a drug debt. Shania's mother was charged with eight different crimes. Relisha Rudd's fate remains unknown, and police are actively following up every tip that comes in. Ray and Faye Copeland Ray Copeland was born on December 30, 1914, in Oklahoma and had a tough start in life. His family moved around often, struggling through the Great Depression of the 1930s. As a young man, he dabbled in petty crime, often caught stealing livestock and forging checks, leading to a year in jail. Released in 1940, he met Faye Della Wilson, seven years his junior. They married quickly and began having children, moving frequently due to financial constraints and Ray's criminal record. Ray's scheme to make illegal money involved employing drifters and homeless men as farm hands to buy cattle with bad checks. Ray would sell the animals quickly, while his employees disappeared. This worked for a while, but he was eventually caught and sent to prison again. After release, he continued the scheme, maintaining distance from his employees. In 1989, a former worker, Jack McCormick, reported seeing human bones on the farm and claimed Ray had tried to kill him. Initially skeptical, the police investigated after checking Ray's criminal record. They searched the Copeland's farm and another family property, finding the bodies of three young men on the farm and more remains on the other property. All five victims had been shot with a .22 Marlin rifle found in the Copeland's home. A register of employees with 12 mark names in Faye's handwriting and a quilt made from victims' clothing were also discovered. In 1990, Faye was put on trial. Her defense claimed she endured violence and abuse from Ray, suggesting she suffered from battered women syndrome. Despite psychologist support, a jury found her guilty on four counts of murder and one count of manslaughter, receiving a death sentence. Faye insisted she knew nothing of the murders and refused a plea deal for conspiracy to commit murder. Her conviction appeal removed the death penalty, but charges remained. In March 1991, Ray was convicted of five counts of murder and sentenced to death. He died of natural causes in October 1993 at age 79. In August 2002, Faye suffered a stroke, left partially paralyzed and unable to speak. Granted her request not to die in prison, she was moved to a nursing home and died in December 2003 at age 83. The couple left behind five children and 17 grandchildren. While uncertain if Faye was involved in the murders, the brutal acts cut short the lives of five young men, Dennis Murphy, 27, Wayne Warner, 27, Jimmy Harvey, 27, John Freeman, 27, and Paul Coward, 21. Lori Hacking Lori K. Sowers was born on December 31, 1976, and was the adopted daughter of her parents living in Salt Lake City, Utah. She met Mark Hacking in high school, and they later married, leading a relatively quiet, normal life. In July 2004, Lori was five weeks pregnant, and the couple planned to move to North Carolina for Mark to start medical school. On July 19, at 10.49 a.m., Mark called 911 to report his 27-year-old wife missing. According to him, she had left for a jog in Memory Grove in City Creek Canyon air of Salt Lake City that morning but hadn't returned, nor had she turned up for work. Later, a witness claimed to have seen Lori that day but withdrew her claim. As police investigated the couple's background, they discovered that Mark Hacking had not completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Utah, as he had led friends and family to believe. His father knew and revealed the truth. Mark had previously falsely claimed to have graduated with honors in psychology, and the North Carolina Medical School had no records of his application. This immediately raised suspicion about Lori's husband. Shortly after Lori's disappearance, Mark was found running naked through the streets. He was taken to the hospital for a mental health evaluation and acquired a defense lawyer. 
Many law enforcement members speculated that Mark's psychological break was employed to give him the defense of insanity or seek refuge. On August 2, 2004, Mark was arrested on suspicion of aggravated murder. Police believed he had acted alone, killing her with a .22 caliber rifle as she slept and then dumping her body in a dumpster. Blood was found in several places in the apartment, including on the headboard of the bed and on a knife in the bedroom. Lori's car had blood, with the seat adjusted for someone six feet tall. The bathtub was unusually clean and smelled of bleach, and the mattress on the couple's bed was new. It was later discovered that Mark had purchased the mattress when he claimed to be searching for his missing wife. Mark's two brothers claimed he had confessed to them five days after Lori disappeared, leading to first-degree murder charges on August 9th. In October 2004, Lori's remains were found in a Salt Lake County landfill, positively identified that afternoon. The carpet she had been rolled into was also discovered. On October 29th, Mark pleaded not guilty to the charge of first-degree murder. Despite pleas from Lori's brother, Mark pleaded guilty to the first-degree murder charge in April 2005 in exchange for dropping other charges. By June 6, he was sentenced to six years to life, the maximum penalty under Utah law. In March 2006, Lori's law increased the minimum penalty for first-degree murder in Utah to 15 years to life, but it couldn't be applied retroactively. Mark's first parole opportunity will be in August 2034. Authorities revealed that Lori discovered her husband's lies about his education when inquiring about his financial aid at the school. When confronted, Mark claimed it was a computer malfunction, but Lori later discovered the truth. It is believed that Mark found a gun while packing and shot Lori around 1 a.m. Mark, coming from a well-educated family, felt the need to meet their standards despite being less academically gifted. Lori's mom maintains contact with Mark's family and has forgiven him for her own sake. A scholarship was created in Lori's name for women who have overcome difficult circumstances to attend college. James Clifford Carson and Susan Carson Prior to 1977, James Clifford Carson appeared to be a hard-working family man living in Phoenix, Arizona. In 1977, his wife noticed odd changes in his behavior, causing her to fear for her safety and that of their five-year-old daughter. She decided to leave her long-term husband. It's unknown what triggered these changes, but Carson showed no interest in reconciling with his ex-wife and daughter. Instead, he began a relationship with Susan Barnes, a divorced woman with two teenage sons. They quickly married and shared an interest in illicit drugs and mysticism, believing in union with a higher power through deep reflection and self-surrender. Carson changed his name to Michael Bear Carson, and his wife changed hers to Susan Bear Carson. In a letter to his daughter, Carson claimed that God had given him his new name. After a year-long trip to Europe in 1980, the Carsons returned home to the United States, settling in the San Francisco area. They continued to pursue their interest in the counterculture and engaged in drug use. Around this time, Michael's ex-wife became concerned that he might abduct or harm their daughter. She took extreme steps to hide, including cutting off contact with acquaintances and moving frequently. In March 1981, a young aspiring actress named Karen Barnes, unrelated to Susan, was found dead in the apartment she shared with the Carsons. She had been stabbed 13 times, had her skull crushed, and was wrapped in a blanket in the basement. The Carsons became prime suspects. Unbeknownst to the police, the Carsons had already fled to a mountain hideout near Grants Pass in Oregon, staying out of sight until spring 1982. They then moved to Alder Point, California, working on a marijuana farm. The Carsons claimed to be anarchists predicting a nuclear apocalypse. In May 1982, Michael shot and killed a man named Clark Stevens, his colleague, with whom he had a dispute. The Carsons attempted to destroy the body by burning and burying it under chicken fertilizer in the woods. Two weeks later, Stevens was reported missing, and his remains were uncovered. The Carsons fled the farm. Police found a manifesto in their belongings, including a call for the assassination of then-President Ronald Reagan. In November 1982, Michael was picked up by police in L.A. but was released before interrogation due to a police error. In January 1983, the Carsons hitchhiked and were offered a lift by 30-year-old John Charles Hellier. Susan decided that John was a witch and needed to be killed, similar to her motives in other murders. 
An argument broke out while driving along Route 101 in Sonoma County, resulting in Michael killing John in front of passing motorists. The Carsons attempted to flee, but were soon apprehended. They initially demanded a press conference to confess, but later recanted and pleaded not guilty. They were convicted of Karen Barnes's murder in June 1984 and sentenced to 25 years each. They were later charged with the murders of Clark Stevens and John Charles Hallier, receiving 75 years to life. During an interview, the Carsons claimed to be pacifists and yoga practitioners who converted to Islam. They justified their acts by claiming their victims were witches, falsely converted to their religion, or had attempted to assault Susan. The Carsons, dubbed the San Francisco Witch Killers, claimed a higher power called on them to kill their enemies for the country's future. While the Carsons remain suspects in a dozen other murder cases, a lack of evidence prevents further justice. Susan is eligible for parole in 2030. Michael's daughter, Jen, described him as pure evil during a prison visit. Claudia Lawrence Described by friends and family as a warm, friendly girl who enjoyed having fun, 35-year-old Claudia Lawrence had a busy, active social life and a successful career as a chef at Good Eric College at the University of York. On March 18, 2009, Claudia returned home from work and engaged in a text conversation with her mother over the phone between 8 and 8.30 p.m., making plans for the upcoming Mother's Day. Claudia's last text message was sent around 8.23 p.m. Two days later, Claudia's father, Peter, reported her missing when she didn't show up for her shifts at work. Police searched her house in Melrose Gate, Huth, York, but found nothing amiss. Her passport and bank cards were still at home, and her bed was made with dirty dishes in the sink, and her toothbrush left on the draining board. The only things that couldn't be located were Claudia's mobile phone, a Samsung D900, and her gray carrymore backpack, the one she took to work and which often contained her chef's whites. One thing that Jared Claudia's initial investigation, which swiftly became a suspected homicide after just six weeks, was that Claudia had recently changed her hair color from blonde to brown. As police dispersed photos of the 35-year-old that pictured her after this change, many thought this soured the investigation from the start. Speculation arose that people may have seen her with different hair colors, leading them to dismiss potential concerns. Additionally, authorities delved further into Claudia's personal life, claiming that she lived a secret life and had a string of lovers, with at least one of the men alleged to be married. The case hit the headlines for the wrong reasons as Claudia was painted as a wild and reckless seductress. While several sightings of Claudia were reported to the police, the most compelling evidence comes from CCTV footage. Although Claudia is seen leaving the college on March 18, the more interesting footage features a man in dark clothing entering the alley behind Claudia's at around 7.15 p.m. He disappears from view for a minute before returning with what could be a bag. The man repeats his actions at 5 a.m., and although it could be two separate parties, they both have the same build and height. Five years after Claudia's disappearance, new forensic tech allowed experts to collect a partial fingerprint from her home and a cigarette but containing DNA from her car. The cigarette brand is Embassy Regal, and the butt is thought to have been from a left-handed smoker. However, both the DNA and the fingerprints remain unidentified so far. In recent years, several arrests have been made in Claudia's case, but all suspects were released without charge, citing a lack of evidence by the Crown Prosecution Service. There are numerous theories about Claudia's fate, ranging from suspicions of murder by a married lover or their spouse to the belief that she left of her own volition. One theory without basis is that Claudia was involved with drugs, while another popular theory implicates convicted murderer Chris Hallowell in the disappearance of the chef. Ten years on, Claudia Lawrence's parents desperately seek answers and justice. Her case remains open, but the investigation has been scaled back, and a much smaller team now works on it. Kelly Crafts Born on July 4, 1947, in Denmark, Kelly Loke Nielsen married Richard Crafts in 1979, and they settled in Newton, Connecticut. Kelly worked as a flight attendant and was well-liked and kind, known for being a hard-working mother. The couple had three children together. Richard Crafts, a former Marine pilot turned airline pilot and part-time policeman, met Kelly in Miami in 1969 
where both were training for their respective jobs. In 1984, Richard was diagnosed with cancer, given a 2% chance of survival. Despite the odds, he overcame the illness. However, despite appearances, the couple's marriage faced challenges. By 1986, Kelly had initiated divorce proceedings upon discovering Richard's affairs. She hired a private investigator and found out about his involvement with another air hostess. Richard claimed that his cancer had returned, but Kelly later learned he was lying. On November 19, 1986, after returning from a flight, Kelly was dropped off at her home by a friend. This was the last time anyone saw her alive. In the following weeks, Richard provided varying accounts of his wife's whereabouts to friends in her workplace, including claims that she was visiting her mother in Denmark or on holiday with a friend in the Canary Islands. Concerns grew among friends, aware of Richard's aggression in the troubled relationship. When authorities were alerted to Kelly's disappearance, they searched the family home. Investigators noticed pieces of carpet missing from the master bedroom, with a nanny recalling a stain on one piece. Further investigation revealed blood smears on the side of the bed and a missing large freezer. Richard's bank records showed purchases of new bed sheets, a duvet, and the rental of a wood chipper, along with a chainsaw. A snowplow driver later reported seeing Richard at the shore of Lake Zor. A search found a chainsaw covered in blood and hair, matching Kelly's DNA. Evidence near the water included metal pieces, human tissue, a tooth with unique dental work, a fingernail with pink polish, bone chips, blonde human hairs, and O-negative blood, the same blood type as Kelly's. Police concluded that Richard fed Kelly's remains into the wood chipper. Identification of death posed a challenge, but a tooth found in the lake matched Kelly's dental records. Richard Crafts was arrested in January 1987, and his trial began in May 1988. The first trial ended in a hung jury, but a second trial resulted in a guilty verdict in November 1989. Richard Crafts appealed his conviction but was denied. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison, eligible for parole in 2021. Carol Damati Charles Chuck Stewart was born in Massachusetts in December of 1959 and was described as a handsome and athletic man. He met Carol Dimity, born March 1959, in 1980 at a local restaurant where he worked as a chef, and she worked as a waitress. The couple married five years later and seemed to lead an average life. In 1989, Charles worked as a general manager for a farrier store and Carol worked as a tax attorney while being pregnant with their first child. On October 23, 1989, the couple was driving through the Roxbury neighborhood after attending a childbirth class when, according to Charles, a black man with a gun and a raspy voice forced his way into the car at a stoplight. The assailant made them drive to nearby Mission Hill, where he robbed them, shot Charles in the stomach, and Carol in the head. Charles managed to drive away and call 911 but Carol died hours later at 3 a.m. on October 24. Their premature baby, Christopher, was delivered but suffered trauma and oxygen deprivation, dying 17 days later. While Charles was hospitalized for six weeks and required two operations, the Boston Police Department searched for the killer based on the description provided by Charles. Willie Bennett was eventually identified by Charles in a lineup on December 28. However, the case collapsed on January 3, 1990, when Charles's brother Matthew accused him of being the killer. Matthew claimed that Charles shot his wife and himself to stage a crime scene. According to Matthew, he met Charles that night to help him commit insurance fraud, but upon arrival, he found Carol shot and his brother apparently self-inflicted to make it look like an attack. Matthew disposed of the gun and their valuables, including wedding rings, off Pine River's bridge in Revere. Some items, including the murder weapon, were later recovered. It was revealed that Charles was upset about becoming a father and concerned about Carol returning to work after childbirth. A $480,000 check from Carol's life insurance policy was issued to Charles, but there was no evidence he cashed it. Charles received $100,000 in life insurance, which he used to buy a new car for $16,000 in cash. On January 4, 1990, just hours after the truth emerged, Charles went to meet his lawyer. His abandoned car was found on the Tobin Bridge in Chelsea, with a note claiming he was beaten by new accusations and sapped of his strength. Charles's body was found in the Mystic River the following day. 
Authorities later discovered Charles had expressed a desire to kill his wife previously. In 1991, Matthew was indicted for insurance fraud and obstruction of justice, pleading guilty and sentenced to three to five years in prison. He was released in 1997 but later apprehended again on cocaine trafficking charges, dying in September 2011 from a drug overdose in a homeless shelter in Cambridge. Willie Bennett, who was initially arrested for the murder, said of Charles in 2017, I'll see him in hell if there's a hell. Carroll's family established the Carroll Dimity Foundation to provide scholarship aid to Mission Hill residents, awarding $1,200,000 to 220 students as of 2006. Rebecca Corium Born in Chester, England, Rebecca Corium was a 24-year-old with a promising future. After completing a sports science degree and a further course in youth studies, she applied for a position on a Disney cruise ship in 2010. Following training in the Disney theme parks of Florida, Rebecca spent four months on cruises to the Bahamas. She then returned home to the UK for two months before going back to work. By March 21, 2011, Rebecca had been back at work for around six weeks. The cruise ship she worked on, The Wonder, sailed out of LA on its usual route. Rebecca, who had been on this route before, sent her parents a message via Facebook, telling them she'd call the next day. However, this was her final message. Rebecca's mother became concerned when her daughter didn't respond for 12 hours. At 9 a.m., off the coast of Mexico, the Wonder Crew realized she had missed the beginning of her shift as a youth worker. Crewmates searched for her but couldn't find her anywhere on the ship. Her belongings were still in her cabin, including ripped shorts and her passport. CCTV footage showed Rebecca talking on an internal phone in the crew area around 5.45 that morning. She appeared distraught and was wearing what seemed to be men's clothing. When asked if she was okay, she replied, Yeah, fine, before walking away. The ship's captain suggested she may have been washed overboard by a wave at the crew pool, but the evidence is inconclusive. The ship's registration in the Bahamas led to a brief investigation by a lone detective from the Royal Bahamas Police Force. However, passengers were not interviewed, and only a few crew members were spoken to. The captain's theory and other speculations raised questions about the information known by Disney and the Bahamian authorities. Despite eight years passing, Rebecca Coriam's whereabouts remain unknown, and her case remains open and unsolved. Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood Gwendolyn Graham, born on August 6, 1963, moved to Walker, Michigan, at the age of 24, and began working as a nurse's aide in the Alpine Manor Nursing Home, a 200-bed facility. Kathy Wood, born on March 7, 1962, joined the nursing home a year earlier. Although Gwendolyn had always been interested in female lovers, Kathy, who had been married, entered a romantic relationship with her in 1986. Their relationship took a dark turn in 1987. The details of who committed the murders remain somewhat unknown, as both Gwendolyn and Kathy blamed each other when they were apprehended in 1988. Kathy later entered a plea bargain, testifying against Gwendolyn in exchange for a lesser sentence. According to Kathy, Gwendolyn murdered five elderly patients, primarily Alzheimer's sufferers, by smothering them with a washcloth. Kathy acted as a lookout, distracting other nurses to prevent the crimes from being uncovered. The women developed a disturbing pattern, attempting to spell out the word murder with the initials of their targets but later settling on a new scheme where each murder would count as a day after saying, I love you for forever and a day. They targeted mentally ill patients, and Gwendolyn allegedly attempted to murder five other women before settling on victims who wouldn't fight back. Their relationship ended, and Gwendolyn began dating another woman. The pair moved to Texas, working in a hospital caring for babies. Kathy eventually disclosed the murders to her ex-husband, leading to an investigation in 1988. Both women were charged with two murders. Gwendolyn was found guilty in 1989 of five counts of murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder, receiving five life sentences. Kathy, who secured a plea bargain, was charged with one count of second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit second-degree murder. She was reportedly released on probation in 2018. The details of who masterminded the killings are disputed, with Kathy portraying Gwendolyn as dominant in the relationship, 
while others claim Kathy was a manipulative liar who orchestrated the murders. Regardless of their roles, the lethal lovers took the lives of five vulnerable elderly women during their spree. Marguerite Chambers, 60, Edith Cole, 89, Myrtle Luce, 95, May Mason, 70, and Belle Burke, 74.